Another 6.30 a.m. wake-up call. Another wicked buffet-style breakfast. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed Yashko is all amped and raring to go. So we hop on the tour bus and get a ride to the first stop of the day. Rome, round two. Nestled in the quiet corner of Rome amongst the fresh-cut grass and elegant flower smells along with the harmonic sound of birds is the Papa Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. This is one of the four churches that are the great ancient major basilicas or papal basilicas of Rome. The basilicas of St. John Lantern, which is stop number two, St. Mary Major or Maggiore, and St. Peter's, both of which we saw previously, are the other three. The basilica was founded by the Roman Emperor Constantine I over the burial place for St. Paul. It is said that after the apostle's execution, his followers erected a memorial called Cella Memoriae. St. Paul is the largest church in the city after St. Peter's. On July 18, 23, it was almost completely destroyed along with its priceless artistic treasures by a fire. It was rebuilt in 1823 to 1829. The facade, decorated with large mosaics, is preceded by a large four-sided arcade. The interior, vast and majestic, consists of a nave and four aisles delimited by 80 huge monolith columns. Amongst this beautiful early 13th century cloister, the basilica contains a number of precious works of art. The 13th century mosaic in the apse representing Christ and the Apostles, for example. We walk through the Porta San Giovanni, a gate in the Aurelian Wall of Rome named after the nearby Basilica of St. John Lantern. Against the skyline, 15 statues of Christ and flanking saints is on the top facade of St. John Lantern, second only to St. Peter's in importance. It was erected at the beginning of the 4th century over an area of the family palace of the Lanterini donated to the church by the Emperor Constantine. Damaged by fires and earthquakes, sat during barbarian invasions, the basilica has been continuously reconstructed, enlarged and enriched with precious decorations and works of art. The building on the other side of the piazza is the Scala Santa. This staircase, according to tradition, was ascended by Christ on his way to be judged by Pontius Pilate. The portrait of Jesus above the altar was thought to have been begun by St. Luke and finished by an angel, earning it the name Picture Without Hands. However, there's something immoral about the Pope Benedict bobblehead sold by the vendor in the front of the Scala Santa. Jeez. Yashko is a genius, taking us to the four major basilicas of Rome. Feeling happy, we marched down the street of Roma, in which case I thought the Italian national anthem would be fitting. It is hard to describe the surreal feeling of walking down the street, turning a corner and seeing the Colosseum in the distance. Seeing it as a backdrop to a much more modern civilization is crazy like who dropped this old building in the middle of the city. Once you get used to the weirdness, it all sort of works. It fits. It's phenomenal, to say the least. The elliptical amphitheater in the center of the city and the largest and greatest works in architecture ever built by the Roman Empire. Its construction started between 70 and 72 AD and was capable of seating 50,000 spectators ready to watch gladiatorial contests, public spectacles, animal hunts, executions, reenactments of famous battles and dramas based on classical mythology. 
Although in the 21st century, it stays partially ruined because of damage caused by devastating earthquakes and stone robbers, the Colosseum is an iconic symbol of Imperial Rome and one of Rome's most popular tourist attractions, still with connections to the Roman Catholic Church. Speaking of stone robbers, we went down to take some pictures of the Ark of Constantine and in coming back we ran into some drunk Roman guards after some rude jokes about black people having huge genitals and some pictures all in good fun, they asked me for 20 euros. Are you f off? They got offended. Gogo was ready to take them inside the Colosseum and shit at them like Russell Crowe did in Gladiator. I pulled Gogo back, giving them 5 euros and told them to f off before I slit their throats with their plastic swords. Shit. Must be all that leftover energy from the ghost of Gladiator's past floating around this place. Before they brought more guards, we dipped out and headed to the Basilica of St. Clement. This is a Roman Catholic minor basilica dedicated to Pope Clement. Three phases of Rome's long religious history lie layered one above another. The first is encapsulated by a peerless medieval church from 1108 to 1130, beneath which lies a second older church founded in 392. Below this again extend the ruins of a temple dedicated to one of Rome's most important pre-Christian cults. Next was St. Peter in Chains. This is a minor basilica best known for being the home of St. Peter's Chains allegedly used to bind St. Peter in Jerusalem. A second set of chains found in Rome when being united they fused miraculously. Also there you can find Michelangelo's magnificent statue of Moses. Michelangelo's Moses, completed in 1515, is depicted with horns connoting the radiance of the Lord. Due to the similarity in the Hebrew words for beams of light and horns, this kind of iconographic symbolism was common in early sacred art, and for the artist, horns are easier to sculpt than rays of light. We move away from the Colosseum along the Roman Forum. In ancient times, the Forum was a civic piazza surrounded by basilicas, temples, and monuments where public life of the city took place. It is part of the centralized area around which ancient Roman civilization developed. From here, we come up behind Capitoloni Hill which is one of the seven hills of Rome. The Capitoloni contains few ancient ground-level ruins as they are almost entirely covered up by medieval and Renaissance palaces now housing the Capitoloni museums that surround the piazza, a significant urban plan designed by Michelangelo in 1536 to 1546. The Basilica of St. Mary of the Altar of Heaven is located in the highest summit of Capitoloni Hill. It is still the designated church of the city council. According to tradition, the church stands on the site where Augustus saw the apparition of a woman holding a child who said pointing to the altar where she is sitting, a prophecy of the coming of our Lord. The last stop of this Roman journey is a building that tends to find itself in almost every picture I took in this area. In fact, this monumental was controversial since its construction destroyed a large area of the Capitoloni Hill. It's often regarded as pompous and too large, clearly visible to most of the city, boxy in shape, lacking a dome or tower, glaring white, and highly conspicuous amongst the generally brownish buildings that surround it. Romans sometimes refer to the structure as the wedding cake or the typewriter. Of course, we're talking about the National Monument of Victor Emmanuel too. The monument to honor Victor Emmanuel, the first king of a unified Italy, 
designed by Giuseppe Sarconi in 1885. The Arsco set us loose in Rome, and Goga and I explored for hours, but we tended to stay along routes we knew and traveled. The chance of getting lost without Yashko to bail us out was too scary. Eventually, we hopped on the train, took a swim in the hotel pool, washed and dried our clothes using the shower stall and hand soap, then went to bed. We woke up, had our last buffet-style breakfast, boarded the bus, and left the hotel. Yashko invited us to sing whatever dead she roamed as we drove away. I quietly hid behind the seat in front of me. <laughs> Rome, go big or go home. It must be where that saying came from. Next is Fiera. <laughs>